Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Explore Classroom. My name is Jordan Lim, and I work in Washington, D.C. at the National Geographic Society on our education team. I'm so happy that all of you could join us today. Um, we've got several classes in our Hangout, but also there are a few joining on YouTube Live. Uh, per usual, for the folks on YouTube, uh, feel free to drop comments or questions that you might have in that sidebar. I'll be checking that out. And yeah, it's so good to have you all. Today, we have Jess Cramp with us today, and I'll say a little bit about Jess before we pass it on to her. Jess is an American shark researcher, marine conservationist, and was a 2015 National Geographic Emerging Explorer. She is passionate about stopping the over-exploitation of sharks and the degradation of our oceans, and believes that fostering a lasting impact requires a comprehensive approach and local buy-in. Um, while living in the Cook Islands, Jess started a grassroots campaign that resulted in the two million square kilometer Cook Islands Shark Sanctuary, and we are so lucky to have her today. So I'm going to pass it over to her now. Jess, welcome, and thank you so much for joining. Thanks, Thanks Jordan. Jordan. Good morning, Good. students. It is 6 a.m. here in the Cook Islands, and when we get off, I will encourage everyone to grab a map and try to find out where I am. I'm in the Cook Islands, just like when you cook food, and I'm on an island called Rarotonga, which is actually pronounced Rarotonga. Um, and I'm really excited to be here with you guys. I'm gonna share a presentation that has some videos in it. Um, it is 6 a.m. here, so you're also gonna hear roosters, so try hard to hear me through those roosters cackling. Um, but if my video glitches at any point in time, if, you, if I can just ask you to be patient, it should um, kick back in. It's just I'm on a really small island and sometimes we don't have that great of internet. So I'll uh, share my screen here and we'll see how we go. Okay, so I am lucky enough to call myself a National Geographic Explorer, and it's really cool that I get the chance to work with Jordan and his team at Nat Geo Education so we can share this all with you guys. Um, importantly, I am from Pennsylvania, and I know we have at least one class from Pennsylvania there, and this is a photo of me as a four-year-old. I thought I wanted to be a fighter pilot, um, then I wanted to be a professional baseball player, then a doctor, but it turns out I was always obsessed with the ocean, um, with exploration, but that really wasn't an option for me. Um, we couldn't, my parents didn't have really any money to take me to the sea, so it's just kind of something I dreamed about. Um, I did when I was a kid, I reached out to a few people that inspired me and I wanted to just take a quick second to give a shout out to Shannon Hooper. Shannon wrote me an email and said she was inspired to be a marine scientist um, from Pennsylvania and so I just wanted to say that thanks Shannon for making this possible. Um, you can absolutely be a marine scientist no matter where you come from. You can come from a little town in Pennsylvania or a big city in the middle of Canada. Um, you just have to follow your dreams. And so this is going to be my story about how I followed mine. Um, since we didn't have a marine biology program where I went to university, I studied biology. I love science. Um, basically, science was about being curious about asking how things worked, how systems functioned. Um, why is a shark called a predator, for example? So I started answering these questions in medicine. I was studying to become, um, or I became a drug discovery biologist, so searching for new medicines. And I love science, um, but truthfully, sitting in a lab all day, every day, that really wasn't for me. I love the ocean, as we learned. I love flying airplanes. Um, so I wanted to know if I could do more for the planet and spend a little more time outside with my scientific training. And so I needed a change. In this photo, I was about, 25 um, and it took me about five years to get the courage to actually quit my job and follow my dreams so i actually put a date on a calendar i quit my job i packed up my apartment and i set out on an adventure to drastically alter the direction of my future i had the opportunity to sail across the pacific ocean i'd been living in panama for about a year uh, volunteering with um, sea turtles and then I had this chance to sail from Rapa Nui, which is a place called Easter Island, all the way across to Tahiti. We were doing plastics research. Um, and because I am a surfer, some of the crew asked me to take my surfboard, jump off the boat, and paddle ashore to see if it was safe for the rest of the crew. So this is the photo that you can see, which is me jumping off the surfboard. But what I had always done was I put a scuba mask around my neck so that I could look uh, at the bottom and see what's around. And what I didn't realize 
is that the crew, they looked to me and said, hey, Jess, turn around. So I put my mask on my face, and this is what I saw. But in fact, I saw five of these guys. This is called a gray reef shark. Um, and the truth is, I wasn't scared at all. These beady yellow eyes were looking at me and just slowly following me as I paddled my surfboard back to the boat. This encounter actually really sparked my scientific curiosity because, you know, you always think you're going to be really afraid of sharks just because of what everyone tells you, what adults tell you. They're dangerous, what the media tells you. They eat people. But um, I actually, I love this encounter. And so it, it, it forced me to really think about sharks and how they're doing in our oceans. But you're probably wondering, well, why sharks? Why are they cool? I probably don't have to tell most of you guys this. Um, but in fact, they're very old. They have been on the planet for over 400 million years. That's longer than the dinosaurs. There are about 1,250 different species of sharks. And when I say sharks, I actually mean sharks and rays. So they're actually in the same family called chondrichthians. They have cartilaginous skeletons. So if you were to wiggle around on your nose, like feel your nose, feel your ears, they're actually made of cartilage, and that's actually the same thing that shark skeletons are made of. There are one, they are one of only three classes of living fishes, and they are actually the most endangered. So this is a reason that actually got me thinking if there was a way I could use my scientific training with my desire to be in the environment and this incredible experience I'd have with sharks to, to do something about it. There's some sharks, though. There's some sharks that live right around our coral reefs, and other ones travel really long travel really long distances, and that makes them very susceptible to fishing pressure. So, unfortunately, some sharks get caught um, on fishing nets, and some in, fish, uh, in fishing hooks. And because of this, their populations are actually severely declining. But also, this is a photo of shark fins drying on a roof. Um, in certain parts of Asia and other parts of the world, sharks are eaten. So some are eaten for shark fin soup. Others are actually used for their meat. Uh, people eat them with fish and chips or um, in cosmetics and also um, for medical. So some people drink um, shark liver oil and believe that it could cure them from cancer. But the problem is that sharks don't actually reproduce that quickly. A spiny dogfish is a type of shark that is pregnant for 22 months. And because some species take a long time to reach sexual maturity, it makes them very vulnerable to overfishing. And upon learning this, I realized that once I got to Tahiti, there was an opportunity for me to actually to help sharks, basically. So I had to move to this island called Rarotonga. This is where I am now. As you can see, it's not terrible. It's quite beautiful. It's in the South Pacific, and the people that live here are Polynesian. So if you've seen the movie Moana, Moana uh, are Polynesian people on an island, uh, Motunui, which is quite similar to Rarotonga here. One of the things that was um, very important to me was to ensure that the campaign that we were going to run so I was part of an organization called Pacific Islands Conservation Initiative, and uh, my boss at the time, Steve Lyon, had an idea to create a shark sanctuary, so a place where sharks could be protected from fishing. But in order to do that, we needed to convince the government that they needed to create this law. So for us, we wanted to make sure that this campaign was supported by Cook Islanders and actually included Cook Islanders and was fronted by Cook Islanders. So, with our little handheld cameras, we asked Cook Islanders how they felt about sharks, um, if they would try to convince their government to protect sharks. And here's my friend Danny Mataroa. Danny is an entertainer, but he's also a farmer, and he's got a little message for everybody. Did you know that sharks have been around longer than dinosaurs? Did you ever wonder why? I feel it's because they have a very important part to play in the whole way of life. Like Lion King. So, yeah. Too late. So Danny obviously won the hearts of lots of kids. Um, and similar to how I'm talking to you guys, I had the chance to get in front of a lot of Cook Islands kids. Sometimes it was just me, sometimes it was our Shark Sanctuary ambassadors, but these are students from an island called Mangaya, 
here in the Cook Islands, and we started putting a shark fin on our head to show support for sharks. And we also learned that sharks are guardians in uh, Cook Islands culture and in a lot of Polynesian culture. So this is Andrea George. She was nine years old at the time, and she drew me this photo. And Andrea and several other students wrote letters, drew photos, and we put those in a, in a portfolio and gave them to the government. And we even got support when we weren't looking. So this is the bank of the Cook Islands. While I was on um, an outer island, Steve, um, my co-champion, sent me this photo. So there was a rubbish or a trash sculpture competition going on, and the bank decided to create a large shark, if you guys can see it, out of their bank trash in support of the sanctuary. And so after 18 months, so about a year and a half of running this campaign, the shark sanctuary was declared. This is um, the head of the fisheries. His name is Taina Bishop. He was the minister at the time. And, you know, obviously he's showing his support for sharks. This was fantastic. So for me, you all know that I'm a scientist. And as a scientist, I started to ask a lot of questions. We had just created, helped to create these laws, which actually, you know, protected sharks. But I wanted to know what that meant, those invisible fences that the laws created, did they, did they contain all the sharks? Were the sharks staying there? Were they swimming in and out? And so I started to ask a lot of questions. And even though I had been a scientist for over 10 years, I didn't know how to do actual shark research. So I spent several years volunteering with different groups, learning the skills to actually study the sharks themselves. And so right now, what I do is I actually get to track sharks to find out where they go in relation to those invisible fences. And I also get a chance to speak about it, which I love doing. So this is my very first time speaking on National Geographic stage about the Shark Sanctuary campaign, about fisheries, about the Cook Islands people, and about my experience. And I also get a chance to do some really cool stuff. So I'm going to show you guys this next video. Today's office includes a submarine in the middle of the Galapagos. I would dare say that I have one of the coolest jobs in the world. Mama, mama. <laughs> There's only one animal that swims like that. <laughs> I'm in the Galapagos with the National Geographic Pristine Seas team. We're going in a submarine right now because it allows us to go deeper into an area that's never been explored before. We need to make sure that we understand what's down there so that we can work hard to protect it. The submarine actually gives off electromagnetic field, which attracts sharks. Oh, fantastic! They're very curious. We just had a silky shark at just 12 meters, so I can't wait to get down to 300 and see what we find. I'm going to reach the deep zone. Okay. The sea floor is dark, so when a giant machine is down there with lights, Organisms get curious. Oh my gosh, swordfish. Holy cow. Out of the blue, yeah, yeah. this swordfish just comes charging into our lights, and you see a flash of silver. Oh my gosh. Don't stab us. Whoa, <laughs> and it whoa. was an exhilarating experience. Beautiful swordfish. And then it's gone. Not only are the Galapagos biologists stream, it's truly mesmerizing. But I have the ability to do this with two other women. We might have been the youngest all-female team down in the submarine. It's a goal of trying to find previous species. I've never felt as much like an explorer than I do right now. There's something about being a thousand feet under the water where no one else has actually ever been that feels, I don't know, like true exploration. So for me, that was one of the coolest experiences of my life. Dr. Enrique Sala, he's an explorer in residence um, running the Pristine Seas program at Nat Geo, invited me on that trip. Um, I'd never been in a submarine before. I'd never seen a swordfish. And so for me, that was a major highlight. Um, but something else that's important to me is my actual research. So while I do study sharks, I also study the laws that are meant to protect them. I want to know if those are effective but also people. And that might sound a little bit funny at first, but basically people are part of the ecosystem. And when I say that, it means we use the ocean, we feed from the ocean, we love, like we love getting in the ocean, we see the ocean, we live by it. So what we do has an impact on the animals that live in that. And so what I do now is actually, um, I study the balance of those, of those three items. And I'm doing that here in the Cook Islands. And the reason I'm showing you guys this photograph is 
unlike um, the United States or Canada or Spain, the borders of the country that I'm in are actually not hard land borders. They are, they're, they're, they're water borders. So you'll see this, um, this graden area. This is actually the, what we call exclusive economic zone of the Cook Islands. So that's actually the country's waters. So the invisible fence of the shark sanctuary is actually this entire shaded in area. But unlike California, for example, where you could, you know, you cross a line and it's very distinctive. You could step a foot in, you know, in um, Nevada and in California, you actually, you know, you cross a very, very invisible line here. So for an animal that swims long distances, they don't know whether they're in the Cook Islands or in Niue next door or in this high seas pocket. And so if the animal stays in the Cook Islands, then it's likely that it could have, you know, greater protection because of the shark sanctuary. But if it swims somewhere else, then it might be susceptible to fishing. And so I basically catch sharks, I place a satellite tag on them and I see where they go. But I have the chance to do this in other places as well. So this is a photo of me um, just a couple of months ago in Western Australia with a very large female tiger shark. She was over 15 feet long. But I do want to make it clear that all of the sharks that we tag, we release. So here's actually a very small shark. This is a gray reef shark. And uh, this is a photo of our release. So you see this lady, she's swimming away quite happily. Um, we try to work as quickly as possible. And then we release the animals, we take the hooks out, and then they will swim around with their satellite tag and we can download that information to our computer. So I also do another type of research where we drop these cameras on the seafloor. So they're called BRUVs for short, but it's a baited remote underwater video camera. They go from about, let's call it 15 feet to about 60 or 75 feet in the water. And that black bag there you see is filled with crushed fish. Now I'm sure you guys can already imagine what the crushed fish is for. What do sharks like to eat? Fish. So we use this to actually attract the sharks. And this next video I'm gonna show you guys is an example of some of the types of things we see on these. Uh, and it's not always sharks. So my video unit weighs about 25 pounds, just to give you an idea of how strong this octopus is. So you see him swatting at these fish? They're actually taking, they're biting him in between the eyes. So while we sometimes have hundreds of hours of video footage to look through, we are blessed with some of those gems, like this, you know, the fighting octopus. Um, I'll show you guys some videos at the end of the presentation as well. But what I'm looking for when we drop these cameras, it's what's called a maximum number of sharks per frame. When I say frame, I mean like a screenshot. So at any point in time, we will pause the video and count any piece of shark in the, uh, in the frame. So this guy that looks kind of grumpy in the, lower, in the lower left, that's called a red snapper. But basically right above that red snapper, you'll see we can see one, two, three whole sharks, and then you see a tail. So that tail would actually count. So if I count the number of sharks in this frame, I get one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. There are 15 sharks just in one frame. And this is actually pretty special. This was on a country called Niue. And in Niue, here's a graph that actually shows the densities of gray reef sharks from around the world. So last year with National Geographic, Beverage Reef here on the left is in Niue's waters. And that, that screenshot that you just saw actually showed that that is the highest density of gray reef sharks anywhere in the world. 
and we got that information and we weren't even in the water with the animals. So the cameras give us a way to actually to study the animals without um, interacting with them, disturbing them, or changing their behavior. Well, we change their behavior a little bit by having the fish, but we need to get them in front of the camera. And so something that's actually really cool, cool part of my job, is that I have the opportunity to use students as my research associates. So these students are 14 and 15 years old from here in the Cook Islands, and they're from an island called Aitutaki. This is where they live. It's quite beautiful. Um, the, the highest point on their island is actually just about 10 feet, and they have this vast, beautiful lagoon. It's called a coral atoll, and it's surrounded by coral reef. So what we did in Aitutaki is we dropped those camera, camera units, the bruvs that you saw, right around the outside of their island. We dropped it about um, a thousand feet apart in between five and you know, 75 feet of water. So it took us um, almost three weeks. And I'm gonna show you guys some of the videos of what we found. So this is a young gray reef shark, and you'll notice that he's using his snout to kind of nuzzle. So inside this um, canister at the end is crushed fish. Now sharks don't have, you know, they don't have hands, so they can't actually kind of feel around. So he's rubbing his body on it. He's nuzzling that fish. And you'll also notice that he takes a couple nibbles, but it takes a little while. So sharks actually, they explore. You know, they don't, you know, really come straight out of the deep and just eat things. Um, they'll explore. There are certain ambush predators that will, you know, take a long time before we can see them, before a sea turtle or a sea lion can see them. And then they might explode and, you know, and take a bite. But I just want to make it, you know, uh, show you guys visually actually what happens when a shark is exploring its food. So here's a screenshot of, uh, of a curious hawksbill sea turtle. So this sea turtle, he probably spent 45 minutes rubbing his body on my bait bag and my bait pole and coming up and tapping his nose on the camera. It cracked me up. Um, students from all over the world have seen this. And I unfortunately, my video is too glitchy, so I just wanted to show you guys a screenshot. But this turtle was using its flippers to hug the bait. It was hilarious. Here's another video. This one, if you look closely, you can see some sharks in the lower right-hand corner. These are eagle rays. They're called spotted eagle rays. And over in the, in the bottom of the screen and in the right, if you look closely, you start to see more and more sharks. Those are actually scalloped hammerhead sharks. And they are swimming with these eagle rays. Now this is in Aitutaki. One of the students dropped this camera. So this is one of their sets. And after Niue happened, we then went to Aitutaki and found even more sharks per frame than we had before. So this is actually quite special because the cameras are really, they're dropped down and they just capture a random hour of footage. So these animals are not interacting with the bait, which means basically that we just got really lucky that in this one hour, we see these scalloped hammerhead sharks and the eagle rays swimming together in front of our camera. You're probably wondering why that matters. So why it matters is that we now know here in Aitutaki off this southern point that these there's a large population of eagle rays and of scalloped hammerhead sharks. This allows the island council and the people of Aitutaki to say, wow, we have these special and hammerhead sharks are endangered species. And then they can use that information to make policies of their own if they want to protect these animals, if they want to take people scuba diving to see these animals, if we are able to do more research. All of this research that we've done is just a first step. Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of Explore Classroom. My name is Jordan Lim and I work in Washington DC at the National Geographic Society on our education team. I'm so happy that all of you could join us today. Um, we've got several classes in our Hangout, but also there are a few joining on YouTube Live. Uh, per usual for the folks on YouTube, uh, feel free to drop comments or questions that you might have in that sidebar. I'll be checking that out. And yeah, it's so good to have you all.
Today, we have Jess Cramp with us today, and I'll say a little bit about Jess, we're passing on to her. Jess is an American shark researcher, marine conservationist, and was a 2015 National Geographic Emerging Explorer. She is passionate about stopping the over-exploitation of sharks and the degradation of our oceans, and believes that fostering a lasting impact requires a comprehensive approach and local buy-in. Um, while living in the Cook Islands, Jess started a grassroots campaign that resulted in the two million square kilometer Cook Islands Shark Sanctuary, and we are so lucky to have her today. So I'm going to pass it over to her now. Jess, welcome, and thank you so much for joining. Thanks, Thanks Jordan. Jordan. Good morning, Good. students. It is 6 a.m. here in the Cook Islands, and when we get off, I will encourage everyone to grab a map and try to find out where I am. I'm in the Cook Islands, just like when you cook food, and I'm on an island called Rarotonga, which is actually pronounced Rarotonga. Um, and I'm really excited to be here with you guys. I'm going to share a presentation that has some videos in it. Um, it is 6 a.m. here, so you're also going to hear roosters. So try hard to hear me through those roosters cackling. Um, but if my video glitches at any point in time, if you, if I can just ask you to be patient, it should um, kick back in. It's just I'm on a really small island, and sometimes we don't have that great of internet. So I'll uh, share my screen here, and we'll see how we go. Okay, so I am lucky enough to call myself a National Geographic Explorer, and it's really cool that I get the chance to work with Jordan and his team at Nat Geo Education so we can share this all with you guys. Um, importantly, I am from Pennsylvania, and I know we have at least one class from Pennsylvania there, and this is a photo of me as a four-year-old. I thought I wanted to be a fighter pilot, um, then I wanted to be a professional baseball player, then a doctor, but it turns out I was always obsessed with the ocean, um, with exploration, but that really wasn't an option for me. Um, we couldn't, my parents didn't have really any money to take me to the sea, so it's just kind of something I dreamed about. Um, I did when I was a kid, I reached out to a few people that inspired me and I wanted to just take a quick second to give a shout out to Shannon Hooper. Shannon wrote me an email and said she was inspired to be a marine scientist um, from Pennsylvania and so I just wanted to say that thanks Shannon for making this possible. Um, you can absolutely be a marine scientist no matter where you come from. You can come from a little town in Pennsylvania or a big city in the middle of Canada. Um, you just have to follow your dreams. And so this is going to be my story about how I followed mine. Um, since we didn't have a marine biology program where I went to university, I studied biology. I love science. Um, basically, science was about being curious about... The order, so that is our first starting with our Niagara Falls class, then our class in Brampton, Canada, then to Hillsborough in the U.S., the Pennsylvania class at Career Cafe, and then Blenheim in Canada. So that's the order, so get ready. And um, ready. when you come to the mic, yeah, say your name, how old you are, uh, just kind of like introduce yourself, let's make this as fun and casual, and let's, let's meet each other a little bit. And um, once again, thank you to everyone for joining, and we've got one class, two, two or three classes that are watching on YouTube, so feel free to drop some questions and I'll try and um, get that going. But now we're gonna swing to our class in Niagara Falls, and I'm gonna unmute you guys right about, let's see, right about now. You gonna say hi? Hi. Wow, that's really <laughs> cool. Yeah, I'm probably yeah. trying. You gonna say hi? Hi. Hi. Um, hi. We wanna thank you for that presentation. That was really informative. We did have a question about you said that you went to school and that you didn't have marine biology in your school, but I didn't catch what university you did go to. Yep. Okay. I went to uh, the University of Maryland first. I was a springboard diver there. And then I went to the University of Texas at San Antonio and I majored in biology and chemistry, actually. Um, I had initially wanted to go to medical school. It's, you know, something that seemed uh, pretty easy to do. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> But then, you know, just had to really listen to my gut. And um, yeah, so then I, I started in medicine and then got back to marine biology. So my follow-up question for that is, you said you were working in a lab for, I, I think it was 10 years or something before you decided to go and become a marine biologist. Did you yes. get any further training in marine biology or did you just simply 
head out somewhere and volunteer and start getting practical experience? Um, it's actually a combination of the two. So thanks. That's a great question. I, I basically, I would query people who had jobs that I wanted and, um, and make a list of the skills that they had. And then I would check myself and say, okay, what, you know, what are they basically what are the main components of what they do that I need so when I was working in the lab I went and got myself self scuba certified um, I reached out to different researchers and asked if I could volunteer for them I think one of the really important components of how I got to where I am is just being willing to work for free um, being humble um, even though I had you know immense training in, in one aspect I, I really needed to lean on others to try to um, to help me and that meant sometimes doing the terrible jobs like only cutting bait for a long time um, it meant saving uh, money saving as much money as I could my, my family does not have any money so in order for me to travel to these places I would work and save and while other friends might have had nice cars um, later people would look at me and say you're so lucky and um, it it's not luck um, it was about really kind of having a strategy toward achieving my goal and it was slower for me again because I didn't come from a beautiful island and I didn't come from a place where um, where there were a lot of internships and opportunities available but I sought those out and then I just sort of gradually checked away at the skills I'd need to to achieve those goals can we ask one last question we're about to hit lunch is that okay go for yep. it okay go ahead dear um I was just going to ask if any of the cameras that you put on, like the sharks, any of the tags, have any of them malfunctions during the shark swimming? Yes. <laughs> so these um, satellite tags, they cost $5,000, almost $5,000 each, and then you pay for the boat time, and you pay for fuel, and you pay for research assistance, um, and sometimes the tags pop off early. Um, sometimes it's because of scientist malfunction, but um, yeah, sometimes the sharks, you know, the sharks get caught. Sometimes the tag just pops off and then you don't get as much data. Great. All right. I just got a message from that class in the sidebar. Thank you so much for participating, guys. Uh, it sounds like you have to go to lunch. So have a good one. Thanks for Thanks, joining. Guys. And now we're going to move to the class in Brampton, Canada. I'm going to unmute your mic. Let's see. You guys are right here. I'm unmuting you. Hi, my name is Lotte, and I'm 12 years old. So my question is, how do you become a shark scientist? So how did I become a shark scientist? Um, yeah. So I had a pretty cool experience with sharks when I was 30. So it took me a long time to figure it out that I wanted to be a shark scientist. And then I realized that with my scientific background, um, that I could actually contribute toward sharks. And so I, um, I basically racked up skills. I went and got scuba certified. I went and volunteered in the Bahamas to learn how to handle sharks, to do shark research. Now I'm doing my PhD in sharks. So I'm still very much learning. Um, but yeah, I basically took a long, the long route to get there and, um, and asked other people if they could help me learn. I read a lot of papers, a lot of books, and, um, and I have fishy fingers 24-7, but I love it. All right, Sasha, guys, bye-bye. <laughs> awesome. Right. Thank you. Great question. I'm going to put you guys back on mute. We're moving to our next class in Hillsboro. I will unmute your mic right now. <laughs> Hi, I'm Charlie. I'm 11 years old, and I was wondering, um, for both of you, what's your opinion? Do you think space or the ocean should be explored more? <laughs> Jordan, you want to take that one first? Oh my goodness. This never happens. Don't ever ask me questions of these. Wow. <laughs> you caught me off guard. Um, man, it, that, is, that is tricky, right? Because we see on media so much with Elon Musk and all the success that they're having with privatized space travel or and privatized like space research that I mean, it's complex. Like, wow, that's getting a lot of attention. I think at the same time, there's so much of the ocean that we don't know about it. and I don't there don't seem to be as many big time projects linked to the ocean at the same scale that we could read about in like the New York Times or see on CNN so I think I'm probably leaning more ocean I think what do you think Jess I mean you probably leaning more towards yeah, ocean I think <laughs> everyone online can probably guess what my answer to that question is going to be I'm gonna say the ocean but um, not just because it's majestic um, we've really only explored a small percentage of it but also because it's on the planet that we live on you know, our ocean is more than 75% of the whole planet. 
um, and we eat from the ocean. We can go and, um, and interact with the ocean. And the fact that we know so little about it, actually, I find um, sad, but also really cool because it means that you know, people your age can go out and still discover new things. There are new species being discovered all the time. So for me, I say ocean all the way. Thank you. <laughs> awesome. Yep. Thank you. All right. Going down to our next class. I got my list. It's the one in Pennsylvania, the Career Cafe. Um, that's a, first of all, that's a great name. I don't know if that's the school name or like a class, but that's awesome. I'm going to unmute your mic now. Hi, we're from Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. We just do these career cafes to learn more about different careers. Um, we're going to defer our first question to Shannon Hooper. She is on your first screen. Shannon um, had to is viewing from home today, so um, we want if you can unmute her and then she'll ask her first question because she set this whole thing up for us. Great, sounds good. Shannon, you're uh, unmuted. Hi. So, <laughs> yeah, I did set this up. And so my question um, is like, how do you go? How do you go about like getting a job in like the marine science, like marine biology? Like, how did you like get the job that you have today? Yeah. So hi, Shannon. First of all, thanks so much for reaching out to me and making this whole thing happen. So this is all because of you. So you should give yourself a good pat on the back. Um, how did I get a job? Well, to be honest. Um, for a long time, I didn't have a job. I was volunteering. So I would, I worked at a local newspaper. I would write articles because, you know, it was, I, I didn't have the experience I needed to get paid to do what I do. Now I have that experience. Um, and I basically, I've just worked hard. And I think it's, um, there's a similar theme for me. And that is that I continue to try to upskill. So even though now I, you know, I have this opportunity to be a National Geographic Explorer and I'm living here and doing the research that I want to do, I'm constantly looking for ways that I can improve my skill set. Um, and in that way, it makes you more employable as well. So right now, um, you know, I'm still doing my PhD, but I have my own NGO and I work really hard to write grants to get funding for my research. And um, I'm really lucky in that National Geographic supports, um, supports what I do as well. So I would say the best way to get a job doing what you love is to just try to make yourself so good that people can't ignore you. That's great. Fantastic question. And yes, Shannon, thank you so much for reaching out. I do appreciate that because you know, we can only schedule so many of these. And it's helpful to know that there are students out there that are working and thinking about this sort of stuff because that also helps inform the work that we do here at headquarters. So thank you so much. And why don't we go back to the Career Cafe if you guys, if anyone else in the class is has a question. Can you tell us more about when you worked in the lab instead of like on the field? Did you hear that? I can't hear you. No, can you come closer? Yep, she's coming closer. Can you tell us more of when you worked in a lab over working in the field? Sure. Um, so some of what I do still involves a lot of inside time. I think um, because I show these fun videos on a boat and I talk a lot about sharks, uh, I might give the impression that all I do is spend time outside when in fact I spend a, a large chunk of my time sitting in front of my computer writing, analyzing data. Um, so in that way, it's not as fun as being in the lab at times um, because in the lab I'm, I'm generally running experiments and then also analyzing data and sitting in front of the computer. But um, my lab work was mostly in between my ears and with my two hands. So I had the opportunity to work with, um, with some robotics in, in the lab work that I did, which was really, really cool. So the robots would actually automate some of the experiments that we were doing. Um, but now I am outside feeling the salt water hit my face. You know, you get a rush of adrenaline when, when it's time to work with a shark. Um, and it gives me an opportunity to see different parts of the world because I do research in different parts of the world. Um, whereas when I was in the lab, um, I was actually able to get up every morning and, and go for a surf and go to dinner with my friends and see my family when I wanted to. And I would run experiments in the day and sometimes I had to do my cellular work at nighttime. Um, but I think the biggest difference is just getting outside and having my work allow me to interact with 
different cultures, with different animals in a lot of different places. So for me in that way, it's um, more rewarding, um, but there were amazingly rewarding parts of my lab work. In fact, I was searching for new medicines. So I'm not sure that, you know, uh, there's a more rewarding job than helping other people. Um, but for me, I, I felt like I really needed to be outside more and interacting with people face to face. Great. And we have just enough time for our last class calling from Blenheim, Canada. Uh, you go, oh, wow, look. Hi, everyone. Sitting. Thank you for being so patient, sitting down, so well behaved. I'm going to unmute your mic right now. Hi. Hi. Hi, Hi. guys. Hi. 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 My, my name is Mason, and I am nine. I have a question for you. Do you travel alone with a partner? Do I travel with a partner? So I am very lucky in that um, I have a partner named Kirby, and he's also a marine scientist. And he can often travel with me, but he has a job. So a lot of times I travel either by myself to my friends in these other places, or I have um, work colleagues that travel with me. So um, while sometimes, in fact, a lot of the time I'm traveling by myself, I always have people in the other countries that are accepting me and that we're working together. So there's nothing that I do by myself. I don't achieve anything by myself. Everything is done um, with at least one other person and, and generally a large team of people. Great. All right. And I almost forgot, but we did have a class. Oh, do you guys have another question? Quickly? No, just Go for it. Uh, hi, my name is Joey, and I have a really big question. Okay, go for it. Okay, do have you saved um, some dangerous sharks before? Yeah. So, what I um, am quite proud that we got laws to protect sharks here in the Cook Islands, and there are endangered sharks here um, called hammerhead sharks, and they're part of that shark sanctuary. There are also sharks called oceanic white tip sharks. They travel really long distances and they are what we call vulnerable. So they're not in as, as much trouble as hammerhead sharks, but they're still in trouble. Um, we have mako sharks here. We've got reef sharks here. So some species are more endangered than others, but I would say the most endangered sharks we have here in the Cook Islands that are protected by law are the hammerhead sharks and whale sharks. Great. All right. And I almost forgot, but we did have a class online on YouTube, watching on YouTube Live that did have a question. It's okay. uh, Miss Beckett's class calling or watching, not calling, watching from Paris, Ontario. And they ask, what is the most fascinating shark you've ever seen or interacted with? Okay. Hello, Mrs. Beckett's class. I... If I, so I study oceanic white tips and silky sharks, and I love those animals. Um, but I think the most incredible shark I've interacted with was a great hammerhead shark, and it was here in the Cook Islands. I do a lot of um, free diving, and so we will swim out and swim over the reef and go out and take photos, um, and sometimes, you know, spear fish for dinner. And my partner was, you know, quite far away from me spear fishing, and I had a camera, and I just felt something and so I turned around and there was a 10 or 12 foot great hammerhead shark that had just come right up to me and I was so in awe of this animal that I completely forgot about the camera in my hand <laughs> and this is why I'm not a National Geographic photographer um, but I basically just had this moment where this shark was looking at me and I was looking at him and then I went to approach him and he got scared and swam away and I never got a photograph. So, but I promise it happened. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Thank you for answering all those questions, Jess. And thank you for um, talking to us today. I know that's pretty far away and you got up early. So I do really appreciate it. And to everyone who watched and joined us today, thank you so much as well. Uh, for the teachers out there that are watching, please visit natgeoed.org. We've got lots of resources, whether it's books or maps or videos like the ones Jess showed. Also, there's Explore Classroom schedules up there, and it's all at natgeoed.org. So please check that out. And what else? I guess that's it. What a great note to end on, being in awe of nature. So once again, thank you, Jess. I'm going to unmute everyone's mic, and we can say bye and thank you.